God, give us the grace to be the light. Yes, God, give us the grace to shine the light of Christ before others that they may see our good works and our love and so that they may in turn glorify the Father in heaven. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is so good to be with you. This morning, is, is it cold in here? Yes. It's cold in here. My, my head is cold. <laughs> my bald head is really cold right now. That's all I'm thinking about. Maybe I should grow my hair back in the winter. But um, yeah, it's, it is so good to be with you. And if this is your first time or if you're new to our church, my name is James. I'm one of the pastors here. And we are so delighted that you're here. And we do pray that you would encounter Christ and his love in a life-transforming way today. And uh, as you can tell from the video, this morning our focus as a church is on the orphan, the plight of the orphans in the world, as well as in our community, in our city. And if you have your Bibles with you, if you can turn with me to the book in the Bible with the coolest name, which we all know is James. Amen. Our church knows its Bible. Amen. So if you can turn with me to the book of James, chapter 1. And when you're there, if you can stand with me for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> This morning, we're going to focus on one verse, 127. But let's start reading, starting in verse 26. If anyone thinks he is religious but does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. Yes, God, this is your word. This is your very word to us. God, this is the word that you have for your people today. And I pray, God, that you would give us ears to hear. God, give us ears to hear. God, in a way that goes beyond our own capacity. God, I pray that you would do a work that goes beyond what I'm capable of. God, I'm weak. But you are strong. I am unable. But you are more than able. So God, would you take your word And would you plan it in every heart and every mind? Spirit, we need you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Lord, we acknowledge your presence in this room. Holy Spirit, we need you. God, we need you. Open the eyes of our hearts. God, show us the wonder and the beauty of the gospel, what you have done for us. God, show us all over again. God, cause us to be in awe. Cause us, God, to be in wonderment of your gospel. God, that it might spur us on to shine the light of Christ before men. That they might see. That they might see our love. That they might see our good works and glorify the Father in heaven. So, Father, be glorified now. Jesus, be magnified. Be magnified. Through the preaching and the hearing of your word. And all of God's people said, Amen. Before we dive into our verse, let me give you the context of our passage so that we understand where James is coming from. In the preceding verses, verses 19 through 25, he talks about the centrality of God's word and how we are to be doers of the word and not just 
hearers. And that's because the scriptures were given not simply to inform, but to transform. Let me repeat that. The scriptures are given not simply to fill our minds with information or knowledge, but to renew them. To renew our minds and to transform our hearts. And that change occurs, James says, when we do what it says. And then in verses 26 and 27, James shows us what a doer of the word looks like. And this is where we realize that there's a kind of religion that God accepts and a kind of religion that he abhors. Don't miss this. There's a kind of Christianity that is worthless and empty, even fraudulent. And there's a kind of Christianity that is pure and undefiled, that's holy. So the scriptures are telling us that it's possible for us to practice a religion that works for us, that's acceptable to us, but it's worthless to God. And the kind that's worthless is one that is characterized first by uncontrolled speech. Look at verse 26 again. If anyone thinks he is religious but does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Notice the relationship between the tongue and the heart. And what James is doing here is reiterating what Jesus said multiple times that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, what comes out of us is a reflection of what's in us. What we say is a reflection of what's in our hearts. So much so that when our speech is not controlled, when our speech is ungodly, when it dishonors God and the people that are made in the image of God, the Bible says we deceive ourselves. We're fooling ourselves. Why? Because that's a demonstration that our hearts truly are unchanged. Then in the next verse, James tells us what a changed heart looks like. Look at it again. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction. And to keep oneself unstained from the world. James says this is pure religion. This is undefiled Christianity. This is what a heart that has been changed by the gospel does. This is what a heart that has been changed by God looks like. It visits orphans and widows in their affliction. You see, religion that God accepts goes far beyond this. It's not just sitting in a church listening to truth and going through the routine of religious activity. No, the heart of true religion, the Bible says, is to care for the most vulnerable in our world. Now, the word visit here means so much more than what comes to mind for us when we hear the word. James is not telling us to just drop by and say hello every once in a while. Listen to the way the word is used elsewhere in the New Testament. For example, Luke 1, 68 says, Blessed be the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. That is not saying God made a short visit to his people. No, he came to them in person. God clothed himself in humanity all for the purpose of redeeming his people. And in Luke chapter 7, verse 16, after Jesus raised the widow's son from the dead, we are told, fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. How? In the person of Jesus. He is God's very definition of visitation. So religion that's acceptable to God is not just paying token attention to the vulnerable. It's visiting them in the way God has visited us. It means going to them, being with them, meeting them where they are in their affliction, caring for them in their distress. It's taking responsibility for their well-being and doing what we can to bring life to them. That's what it means to visit 
the orphan and the widow. Now it's important that we understand that what James says here in verse 27 is not said in the vacuum. Meaning he's not arbitrarily singling out orphans and widows as people we ought to care for. No, what he's doing here is simply reiterating what God has said throughout the Old Testament about the people that he cares about. And when you read the Old Testament scriptures, you find that there are three groups of people, three groups that God singles out time and time again as the objects of his love and mercy, and they are the orphan, the widow, and the sojourner. The orphan, the widow, and the sojourner. For instance, Deuteronomy 10, 18 says, he executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Psalm 146, verse 9, the Lord watches over the sojourner. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. So God describes himself as their defender, their protector, and their provider, and not surprisingly, he expects his people to do the same. We see an example of this in Deuteronomy 14, 28, where God says, At the end of every three years, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in that year and lay it up within your towns. And the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your town shall come and eat and be filled, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. So God promises blessing to his people to bless those who bless the orphan, the widow, and the sojourner. Conversely, God also warns of judgment to those who mistreat them. For instance, in Exodus 22, 21, God says, You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will hear their cry and my wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. Wow. God's not messing around here, is he? I need you to feel the way that he is dead serious about caring for the orphan, the widow, and the sojourner, and, and that his people not mistreat them, and all of which begs the question, why? Why does he care about him so much? Why is God, why is the God of the universe so drawn to the orphan, the widow, and the sojourner? Here's why. Because they were the most vulnerable. Because they were the most helpless. To be a sojourner meant that you were incredibly vulnerable because in that day your tribe was everything. Your tribe was everything and to be away from them meant that you had nothing. And to be a widow in that day is vastly different from what it is to be a widow today. Today there are all kinds of social programs to care for widows. But no such thing, no such program existed in biblical times. To be a widow in that day meant that you were entirely on your own. You had no one to look out for you, and it was even worse for the orphan. There were no welfare programs for orphans. There were no orphanages to take them in. There was no foster care system. To be an orphan in that day meant that you were entirely on your own. With no one to protect you, no one to provide for you, no one to care for you. You were entirely on your own. And it's one thing for a grown-up to fend for themselves. It's another thing for a child to fend for himself or herself and survive in a brutal world. And understandably, they were the most vulnerable in that society. And that's why God refers to himself as a father to the fatherless. God... Our God, the God of the heavens, the God of the universe says, I am their father. I am the father to the fatherless. He is decisively drawn to them and he takes up his cause and consequently he expects Israel to take up their cause. Why? Because that's exactly what God had done for them. Israel was a sojourner, wandering aimlessly before God called them and made them his people. Israel was the widow before God became her husband. Israel was the orphan before God became their father. And now he says, I want you to do for them what I have done for you. And listen, it is no different with us today. It is no different with you and me. 
We were sojourners, were we not? Wandering aimlessly in this world until Christ found us and saved us. We were spiritual widows until Christ, our bridegroom, betrothed us and entered into an everlasting covenant with us. And we were spiritual orphans without a father until Christ adopted us through his life and his death and his resurrection. That was us. And that's what it means to be a Christian. Hear me on this. A Christian is one who says, that was me. That was me. I was helpless. I was vulnerable. I was naked. I was hungry. I was fatherless. But I was shown mercy. God had mercy on me, and he sent his son to rescue me and make me his own. So when you come across someone who is actually helpless, actually naked, actually vulnerable, actually fatherless, you know what you see? You see yourself. And this is what Tim Keller said. He said, when you look in the face of that individual, when you look in the face of that child, you see yourself. You see who you once were and what God in Christ has done for you, and that in turn causes you to do the same for them. You see, orphan care will not mean much to you until this single truth takes a hold of your heart, until you see just how personal this is. That that is exactly what God has done for you. That when we were spiritual orphans without a father, Christ came for us. He sought us out. He sought you out. And he brought you to himself. And he made you his own. He adopted you into his family. I know that you've heard that a thousand times. Hear it again. Feel the weight of that all over again. Christ came for you. He came for you. It reminds me of a conversation I had with my son, Kaya, when he was about four. And I've shared this story before. But Kaya is my, is my firstborn. And if you're new to our church, my wife and I, we have four children. We have two adopted boys and two biological girls. And Kaya is our first. But there was a conversation we had when he was about four. And that's about the stage in a kid's life when they ask why about everything. Right, parents? You know what I'm talking about. They ask why incessantly, nonstop. Hey, Kyle, look at the dog. He's just so happy to see you. Why, Daddy? I don't know. He just says, he's, he's wagging his tail. Hey, son, bring, a, bring Daddy a book. Why, Daddy? So I can read you a, a story. Why, Daddy? Because that's what daddies do. <laughs> why, 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 why? There was a day when I said, I love you, Kaya, which I say to him every day. I love you, Kaya. And sure enough, she goes, why, Daddy? Why do you love me? Why do I love you? Because you're my son. Why, Daddy? Why am I your son? And I said, because I came for you. I came for you. When Mommy and Daddy got the phone call that you were born, we were so happy. We were so excited that we dropped everything and we came for you because we wanted you to be a part of our family. We were actually on the five heading down to Disneyland with our niece, Ellie. We got the phone call and we turned that car around and picked them up at the parking lot. The God of the universe looks at you and says, I love you. Why God? Why do you love me? Because you're my son. Because you're my daughter. Why, God? Why am I your son? Why am I your daughter? Because I came for you. I came for you. I came for you. And may I remind you, let me point out that it wasn't because you were so irresistibly cute. God didn't choose you because you were so stinking adorable and he just had to have you. No, it's actually quite the opposite. 
Russell Moore in his book, Adopted for Life, writes this. He says, imagine for a moment that you're adopting a child. As you meet with a social worker in the last stage of the process, you're told that this 12-year-old has been in and out of psychotherapy since he was three. He persists in burning things and in attempting repeatedly to skin animals alive. He acts out sexually, the social worker says, although she doesn't really fill you in on what that means. She continues with a little family history. The boy's father and grandfather, great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather all had histories of violence ranging from spousal abuse to murder. And each of them ended their own lives. More rights, think for a minute. Would you want this child? If you did adopt him, wouldn't you watch nervously as he played with your other children? Wouldn't you watch him nervously as he looks at the knife on the kitchen table? Would you leave the room as he watches a movie on TV with your other kids with the lights out? Well, he's you. And he's me. More is right. He's us. We are that child. Ephesians 2 describes us not as cute, sweet, or calm, but as unruly, wicked, and rebellious, following the devil and satisfying the sinful cravings of the flesh, living as objects of wrath. That's how the Bible describes us. There was nothing in you and nothing in me that drew God to us, and yet he pursued us and came for us and made us his own and adopted us into his family. Paul says in Galatians 4, 7, so you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son did an heir through God, oh, Christian, let that land. Let that sink in. You are no longer a slave. You are now a son. And not only a son, you are an heir of God. Try to wrap your head around that. What does it mean to be an heir of God? What does it mean to be, to have an inheritance waiting for me? That all that God is, everything that God is, everything that God has, the unsearchable riches of his grace belong to me and you because we are his children. What in the world does that mean? Now, there are a couple of things I want to point out here. The first is that in the ancient world, the father's inheritance was restricted to his sons. Only sons could gain an inheritance. Daughters could not. And guys, that's why he keeps addressing everyone, all of us here as sons. Paul, contrary to popular opinion, was not a misogynist. He is not being chauvinistic as many today accuse him of being. No, he's saying as far as God and his inheritance is concerned, we're all sons. Now that raises an important question. What if a man didn't have a son? What if a man, like some of us, only had daughters? What happens then? In the ancient world, if a man didn't have a son, he would adopt a son. He adopted a son so that he would have an heir. Here's what this means. God's adoption of sinners like you and me wasn't necessary. God didn't have to adopt us because you see, God already had a son. He didn't need an heir because God already had an heir. But in his great love and his unfathomable mercy and his amazing grace, God sent us a son. He gave us his heir, and he crushed him so that you and I might become the sons and heirs of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's something else that we need to know about our adoption. Adoption in God's mind was in plan B. It was in plan B. Paul says in Ephesians 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, even as he chose us in and before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Paul says adoption wasn't plan B for God. No, it was plan A. It wasn't second best. 
It wasn't some consolation prize. It wasn't an afterthought. No, it was planned from eternity past, before the foundation of the world. And that is why John Piper says adoption is the heart of the gospel. And why J.A. Packer says our understanding of Christianity cannot be better than our grasp of adoption. In other words, the extent to which you understand the doctrine of adoption is the extent to which you understand the gospel. Guys, here's why I'm harping on this so much. Because as Tony Meredith said, your theology inevitably leads to your biography. Let me say that again. Your theology inevitably leads to your biography. What he is saying is this. Your understanding of God will determine what you do with your life. Your belief about God and who God is and what God has done, your understanding of God will determine how you live. Always. Always. That's why when it comes to the subject of orphan gear, the place where we have to begin is to understand what God in Christ has done for us. And that's why adoption for us as believers isn't just a good thing to do. No, the gospel necessitates it. The gospel necessitates that we do for others what God and his grace has done for us. Now, I don't mean that every Christian is to adopt. That's not what I'm saying. I don't believe everyone is called to that. But I do believe every Christian, everyone who calls Christ their Lord, Savior, and King has a stake in the matter. I believe that with all my heart. Why? Because God does. Our God has a huge stake in the matter. And if we are his people who are to love what he loves and hate what he loves, hate what he hates, if we are his people called to be imitators of God, then we have got to care for the things that God cares about in this world. And guys, that's why what we do as Christians isn't mere humanitarianism. And it's not driven by altruism. That's why adoption isn't for couples who can't have kids. You know what it's for? It's for people who are attuned to the gospel. People who love the gospel. People who have been changed by the gospel. People who want to live out the gospel and proclaim the gospel with their lives. Because when the redeemed extend the hand of mercy to children in need... And bring them into their hearts, bring them into their families. The world at that moment gets a real life picture of the gospel. Guys, think about how counterculture it is for Christians to adopt a a boy with a cleft palate from India where most see him as cursed by the gods. Think about how counterculture it is for Christians to adopt children of another race or ethnicity, white adopting brown, brown adopting yellow, yellow adopting black. Is there a better way? The model to the world of God who adopts children from every nation, tribe, and tongue. So it's the gospel. It's the gospel. That's what's at the center of orphan care. It's the gospel that compels us to care for orphans and adopt them. But that's not all. It doesn't end there. It's the gospel that sustains us in our care for orphans. In other words, what motivates us to adopt them, to bring them into our lives, to visit them and care for them, is the very thing that sustains us in that care. I say that because adoption, for the most part, is not easy. I believe much of what's done for orphans in our culture, even in our church culture, is owing to altruism our selfless concern for the well-being of others, and in some respects, even a desire for selfish gain. And that was sort of the case with me. You know, when Eugene and I were looking to adopt our second child, we wanted to adopt internationally. We got Kaya from the foster care system here in L.A., but for the second child, we wanted to go international. And the first country that I looked into was the Dominican Republic. Now, why the Dominican Republic, you ask? <laughs> you know, if you know anything about me, you know that I, I love baseball. <laughs> you know where this is going. That is my favorite sport. I'm passionate about baseball, and I'm a diehard Dodgers fan. 
I am so amped about the Dodgers. The, all the signings and the trades, Yamamoto, Otani, we got Shohei. Glass now, Hernandez, I can't wait for baseball to begin, but I digress. <laughs> but as a diehard baseball fan, I know that that tiny little country produces a lot of great <laughs> baseball players. In fact, some of the best players are from the Dominican Republic. And so I envision adopting this boy from the Dominican Republic who would one day grow up to play shortstop for the Dodgers. <laughs> you think I'm joking? I'm not, ask Gene. I was serious about it. But much to my chagrin, we didn't meet the requirements for the Dominican Republic, and I was bummed. The door was shut. So you know where I look next? Venezuela. Because that socialist country also produces a lot of amazing baseball players. And so I started looking to Venezuela, but again, much to my chagrin, we didn't meet the requirements and the, that door was shut and I was bummed. And when that didn't work out, I wanted to look in Puerto Rico because that little island also produces a lot of baseball players. And that's when Gene put her foot down and said, no more, stop acting a fool. We are not <laughs> trying to get a baseball player. But I believe that kind of mindset is a lot more common than we would like to admit. I mean, adoption has become almost trendy in our day. It's cool to care for orphans now. And we see all these celebrities, right? Angelina Jolie, Charlize Theron, Sandra Bullock. We hear, is there somebody that has not adopted? But all these celebrities adopting children were tempted to jump on that bandwagon. And I think there's a thought in the back of a lot of people's minds that it would be so cool to have a kid from another race or country in our Christmas card, in our family Christmas card that we send out to all of our family and friends. But here's the problem with that. What happens when a child brings it to your home isn't all that cute? What happens when a child is suffering from emotional dysregulation and can't even sit still for the family photo without melting down and causing a scene? What if you try to love that child, but she rejects it time and time again? Because any time a male, any time a man showed her affection, it was to use her. What happens when the child you bring into your home has violent outbursts because of his past trauma, because he has seen and experienced things that no child should ever see or experience? You see, altruism will not get you through that. There's only one thing that will. The only thing that will carry you and sustain you in that is the cross, the cross of Christ. And Gene and I experienced the truth of this in our own lives, especially as it relates to our second son, Jackson. Some of you here know Jackson, and you know what a, what a wonderfully unique child <laughs> he is. He can be loud and boisterous and sweet and endearing at the same time. And my son has three loves in this world. He loves attention. He loves attention. Jackson, for Jackson, all attention is good attention. <laughs> Second, he loves baseball like his daddy, so I may have my shortstop after all. <laughs> and third, he loves his mama. Gene is that little boy's world. But that's Jackson. But sometimes he can withdraw from people. Sometimes his deep-rooted anxiety and shame look like irritability, rejection, and defiance. And over the years, I've seen the way people react to him. Some kindly with a desire to understand, others not so much. And I've seen a lot of people look at him dismissively. And I heard the comments. I've heard the judgments, what's wrong with that kid. But I wish those people knew. I wish they understood. I wish they understood that he had a whole history before we ever got him, before he was even born. And this is where I want to be careful. I want to make sure that his story is one for him to tell and not disclose too much. So I want to be careful. 
But I do want to share that we got him when he was two months old. And at two months, we were his third home. We were his third placement. And when in one of the previous homes, he was severely neglected. Where as a newborn baby, he was left to cry in the crib for hours on end. Rather than being picked up and comforted and soothed, he was just left in the crib to cry. All of which has had a great effect on him psychologically, emotionally, physiologically. Oh, I wish they knew. I wish they understood. I wish they understood how, early, how hard those early years were, the outbursts, the tantrums, the meltdowns, to where I had to do business with God over this. More specifically, my resentment towards him for the sheer exhaustion and difficulty, for all the nasty stuff that brought up in my own heart, the ugliness I had to confront in myself, as well as all the hopes and dreams that were dashed, all the expectations that were crushed. I had to do business with God over this. But I'm at a place in my life now where I thank God for his sovereign grace. I thank God for his perfect love. I thank God for Jackson. I love that boy to death. He still drives me up the wall at times, but man, I wouldn't trade him for the world. And I thank God that he, got, that he chose me to be his dad. And for what that little boy has taught me. Because you see, Jackson, more than anyone or anything, has taught me the beauty and the power of the gospel. And God knows I'm speaking the truth here. Jackson, more than anyone or anything, has taught me what the gospel is all about. Because you see, I look at Jackson, I see the cross. You see how? Here's how. It's at the cross that I see that the very things that I struggle with in him are in me. It's at the cross that I see my own outbursts and tantrums and meltdowns. It's at the cross that I see that I myself was traumatized and broken by sin. How I was controlled by my own sinful impulses, but it's at the cross that I see the amazing love of God. The love that saw value in me. That saw beauty in me, in me. And he pursued me, and he came for me, and made me his own. The love that never gave up on me. No matter how much I rebelled, no matter how many times I failed, no, he came for me. For me. And he found me and he brought me to himself and he loved me as his own. And when you realize what took place at the cross, you realize that you are not a rescuer. Listen. We are not a group of altruistic people out to save these poor little orphans. That is not what this is about. We are not the rescuers. We are the rescued. We are the ones that have been rescued from far, far worse. And when you get that, you get why God calls us to care for the most vulnerable among us. Guys, we're told all over the Bible, this is undeniable, that the love we have received from God is to be reflected in our lives. Those who receive God's love are to reflect God's love. Those who receive God's love are to reflect God's love. It's all throughout the Bible. For example, in 1 John 3, 16, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Do you see it? Do you see it? We receive his love. He laid down his life for us. And now we are to reflect that love to others. How? In the same way. By laying down our lives for them. By laying down our possessions. 
by laying down our rights, by laying down our comforts, by laying down our plans, by laying down our hopes and dreams, by laying down our vision of what a family should be for the sake of those in need. The Bible says when you have received his love, you will reflect his love, listen, even when it costs you. Even when it costs you, even when it comes at a great personal cost. Why? Because you realize that it costs God everything to make you his. This week, Gene shared with me a blog written by an adoptive mom named Stacy Gagnon. And I want to share with you a part of what she wrote in a post entitled Fear, a story of adoption. She writes, I hear a lot of what ifs in the world of foster care and adoption. In fact, I lived in, I lived in the what ifs before jumping headlong into an adoption that almost drowned me in fear. What if the baby I'm fostering goes back to the biological parents? Oh, what if I have to give her back? What if I adopt a child with severe behavioral issues? What if the child adopt, I adopt can never live independently? It's scary. I've been there in the what ifs. I know all about these what ifs. And they are very real fears. She continues, I think that as Christians, we are very good at measuring the sacrifice. Wow. Let me read that again. As Christians, we are very good at measuring the sacrifice. We apply logic and control to choices and operate out of our fear. But how can we live a life that dares to make a difference if we are too scared to try? When Peter saw Jesus walking on the water, he asked if he could go out to him. And Jesus said, come. And Peter walked out to him and had an experience that changed his life. It's obvious that fear is a very real thing. But what if he, we dare to go out on the water anyway? When Jesus asked his disciples to leave all that they knew as fishermen and follow him, and he would make them fishers of men, I have to think fear was there. There must have been a few real moments where they looked at each other and asked, what if? What if they had looked at Jesus and asked him, what if you are not who you say you are? What if things go poorly and we lose everything? What if our families think we're crazy and they mock us and ridicule us? I cannot imagine how things would have been different for them. But they followed. They followed. And they became friends with the creator of the universe. She concludes, I can look back and see how I needed to have vain conceits, selfish ambitions, and countless fears destroyed. I can look back and be humbled by a woman who lay on the bathroom floor begging God to see me out of this decision. And I can see how he sat beside me as I let go of all the things I thought, I, that I thought gave my life meaning, worth, and control. But the most beautiful part is what we find after we have gone beyond the what-ifs. At the end of myself, I have found him. At the end of myself, I found God. Gene and I have experienced this as well. Our journey in adoption has brought us to the end of ourselves in more ways than one. And in coming to the end of ourselves, we have, we have found God. We have come to know God in ways that we otherwise might not have had we not taken that journey. And all of our fears, every tear, all the tears that were shed, all the what ifs, all the what ifs, they were all worth it. All of it was worth it because of what we have gained in God. And we're not the only ones. Several years ago, I was part of a pastor's panel at KFO Summit Conference. KFO stands for Christian Alliance for Orphans. That experience changed me. I walked among giants at that conference. 
some of the unsung heroes of our faith where you had over 1,700 Christian men and women who quietly yet courageously care for the most vulnerable children in our world without fanfare, without applause. For instance, we saw couples, families that adopted children in the teens. I don't mean teenagers. I mean 13, 14, 15 kids. We attended this one seminar that was led by this older couple, this elderly couple, and all they did was took in terminally ill children. That was their ministry. They took in children that were dying so that they can experience the comfort and the love of Jesus as they die. Who does that? Who does that? Who does that? I'll tell you who. People that are driven by the cross. People that are shaped by the gospel. People who understand that they are the rescued. That they are followers of a Savior who laid down his life for them, and now they are laying down their lives. They are sacrificing their comforts, their hopes and dreams, their plans for a world in desperate need. There are over 153 million orphans in the world today. If they were a country, they'd be the seventh largest country in the whole world. This isn't just a global crisis. There's an orphan crisis here in America. More than 800,000 children pass through the foster care system in America each year bouncing from one home to another. In L.A. County alone, there are 33,000 children currently in foster care with 500 children awaiting adoptive families. 500 children right now, right now, that that are waiting to be adopted, that are waiting for their forever families. 500. You know how many churches there are in L.A. County? 2,100. There really is a church on every corner. And I'm just talking about evangelical churches like ours. There are 2,100 evangelical churches in L.A. County alone. You know what that means? That means if one out of four churches, not one out of four Christians, if one out of four churches took in a child, All of those children would have a home right now. And yet each year only a small percentage of Christians open the door of their hearts and their homes to these children. We really have been given so much. We've been given so much. And far too often in the church, we squander God's blessing on ourselves, forgetting that we have been blessed. We have been blessed to be a blessing. That's why James says what he says in verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father. Notice how he puts a father in there. He didn't have to. He could have just said religion that is pure and undefiled before God, but he puts Father in there to remind us that we now have a Father. Because of Christ, because of the cross, we now have a Father. You are no longer an orphan. You are no longer fatherless. A religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is just to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Notice the second part. That second part, to be unstained, to be kept from being stained by the world is not separate from what he says in the first part. No, they go hand in hand. And what James is saying is this. What is of great concern to God will be of no concern to you when you are corrupted by the world. What is of great concern to God will be of no concern to you when you are conformed to the pattern of this world. When you live like the rest of the world, when your values are shaped by this world, things like caring for orphans will not matter to you. And so James is issuing a warning, be careful. Be careful. Be careful that you're not shaped into the world's mold because when that happens, you will miss the heart of true religion. You will miss the very heart of God. 
At this time, I want to do something that David Platt did at his church. And it is to pray a prayer together as a church. It's an incredibly simple prayer. But it's a prayer that I want to invite every follower of Christ within the sound of my voice to pray. And we're going to put it up on the screen. I invite you now to pray this prayer with me out loud, phrase by phrase. Father, I will do whatever you call me to do to care for the orphans in our world. In Jesus' name, one more time. Father, I will do whatever you call me to do to care for the orphans in our world. In Jesus' name. I don't know what God is going to call you to do, but I'm excited to find out. I believe God is going to call some of you here to adopt it. We have families at our church right now, Sonny and Eddie Cho, Nick and Chelsea Eschner, that are in the process of adopting children. I believe God is going to call some of you to be a foster parent, to foster a child. or to provide respite care for children in need of temporary care. And we have a couple, Andrew and Michelle Lynn, that are doing that right now. I believe God is calling some of you, God is going to call some of you to come alongside, come around our families that are in the process of adopting or fostering to assist them in all the ways that they need, and they need a lot. Financially, physically, emotionally, they're going to need your help. And I believe God is going to call some of you to be a part of what we are doing as a church this year that we are super excited about, and that is Royal Family Kids Camp. Royal Family Kids Camp, in a nutshell, is a five-day camp. It's a five-day camp that we're going to be hosting for the very first time in partnership with an organization called For the Children, whose mission is to mobilize the local church to create life-changing moments for children who have experienced relational trauma. So this is a camp specifically geared to foster children coming out of trauma. And so for five days, we, as God's people, we're just going to come around them. And we're just going to love on them. We're just going to love on these children with the love of Jesus so that they might experience healing and restoration in Jesus. And at this time, I want to invite the individual who's going to be directing the camp. And that is none other than our own Eugene Laksana. So if we can put our hands together for Eugene. Come on up, Eugene. Oh, I think it's that one. This paper is not staying on here. <laughs> Hold on. I'm just balancing it. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Give me one second. I'm going to put this away and I'm going to figure this out. All right, let's try that again. <laughs> All right, so two summers ago, Alice and I had lunch with a friend um, who had just come back from ser- serving as a counselor at a summer camp that her church had hosted. It was about five days long at this undisclosed location, and it was created for foster kids uh, ages 6 to 12 years old. Uh, they were children who had somehow encountered some unspeakable relational trauma at their young age. And it all started off with a royal welcome. As the bus carried the children into the camp, there was a red carpet that rolled out. Music started playing, the camp staff cheered, and raised decorated signs over their heads uh, with their child's name on it. Some kids were okay with the loud welcome, others were not, and so because of sensory overload, and so they were offered a quieter one. Either way, the message was very simple. These kids were wanted here. 
And despite the initial excitement, the first few days proved to be very challenging. The kids did not listen to the counselors. They kicked dirt at them. They fought with each other. They insisted that the only reason that the counselors were there were because they were being paid to do so. But in truth, they weren't. And now that I think about it, they probably had to fundraise to be there. <laughs> and each counselor patiently assured and had to reassure their kids that they were not there because they were being paid, but because God loved these kids and they wanted, them to, be, uh, they wanted to be there for them. And the next few days tested this claim with fire, but suffice it to say, by Wednesday, the kids began to humor the possibility that maybe, yeah, these counselors weren't being paid. Maybe they actually did care. And guards came down, kids cried, they shared stories about being neglected, unwanted, and abused in the hands of trusted relationships. One 10-year-old shared that this camp was like an oasis in the middle of the desert. It's a 10-year-old, that's the age of my class in Kingdom Kids. Why in God's name is the 10-year-old in the middle of the desert? And of course, uh, this camp would not last forever, and before they knew it, it was already Friday. The walls quickly came back up at the disturbing reality that was beginning to dawn upon these kids. They had a life to return to, and it wasn't the one where they would be seen as kings and queens. I remember my friend telling me after all this, the kids shut off. One second they were hugging and crying uh, to their counselors about how much they were going to miss them. Promises were exchanged about, I'll be back next year. And as soon as the foster parents came, they detached, went home without a shred of emotions. Only time would tell whether the seeds that were planted that week would be stolen by the enemy or take root in good soil. And it was this chilling reminder that the battle against hopelessness and despair was far from over. Despite that, I'm happy to say that when I visited my friend's church later that year, the kid she had counseled ran up to her as we were talking and gave her a hug. She joined our children's ministry. And today, Living Way is joining the fight against childhood trauma. We're officially bringing Royal Family Kids Camp to Pasadena. <laughs> All right, and here's why we're doing this. Uh, AV team, if you could pull up the slide. Uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, my ministry partner, Nick, and is it gonna go up or are we? Okay, cool. <laughs> no, not that one, the other one. Is the, is the number over there? If not, I have numbers here too. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> uh, all right, and here's why we're doing it. About a year and a half ago, my ministry partner, Nick, and, uh, had suggested that we take a survey of our members and listen to how God had spoken to our church about ways we should engage our community. Uh, me, ever prone to jumping to conclusions, told him that we're wasting our time because I felt like it was already pretty obvious about what uh, people here cared about. But needless to say, he won that argument. And so we took a survey, and the results are here. 63, uh, 63 of you guys responded, and 59% of that 63 said you wanted to engage orphans. And the next two biggest categories were family and poverty and youth. And the only reason that we didn't hit 60% was because one of my assistant directors, Sarah, where are you, Sarah? <laughs> uh, Sarah uh, forgot to mark that she wanted to care for orphans in her survey results. And so we're at 59% instead of 60. I'm not salty at all. In reality, 60% of you guys are crazy enough to want this to work out. But I don't think that the number should come off as a surprise. Uh, the congregation has adopted children. Some of you guys are currently in the process of adopting. And have you seen how many MFTs we have at Living Way? We can probably open up a clinic if we actually tried. <laughs> um, it's, and it's not just the vast array of talents that I think God has given to our community. Over the past four years, I've really learned that Living Way takes Ephesians 1, 3 to 5 so seriously. And it rings at the heart of our community. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. We're a community who sees the gospel not as only a way for sin to be forgiven and alleviated, but a way for God to take us into his family, where he is his, our heavenly father, and that's the only thing that we have to stand to give to the fatherless who live invisibly among us. All right. So here's my gamble. We spent a lot of time discerning. We think that God's moving, living way to do this. Uh, there are so many stories of ways that he's already provided for this camp so far. Uh, but I'm going to save those stories for a little bit later. 
This is the time where I take the past two years of ideating, need finding, team building, training, support raising, visiting DCs, meeting with social workers, and planning that my team has put into this camp and offer it all up into his hands by reaching out to the rest of you because this camp is literally impossible to do unless the rest of you guys rally around it. I mean, I'm literally, I, I have a degree in computer science, guys. I, I'm not even educated to talk to people. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So if you think that we placed the right bets by sinking our teeth into this effort, then I invite each of you guys to partner with us. So here's the deal. Volunteer signups open today. We're going to have an information meeting from 1 to 2 p.m. I'm going to use that time to show some really concrete logistics around what is going to be involved with this camp. Anybody who is interested in participating in any way, shape, or form, even if you cannot attend to the camp itself, should just show up. And I want to answer as many of your questions as possible, and I'm sure there are many. And in addition, we also have an, a community engagement associate from Olive Crest here with us today who's going to share what it would look like for Living Way to partner with foster agencies. And she's been a very valuable resource to my team. Uh, we hope to bring her expertise into this work. So I'll see you guys there. Thank you, Eugene. I've been so blessed by Eugene and just his heart that has grown tremendously for the orphans <clears throat> in our world. And I too want to encourage you. If you have any interest whatsoever, if you can, well, we'd love to have you at one o'clock just for you to be informed as to what this camp is about and how you might be called to it. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, I'm willing to do whatever you call me to do. To care for the orphans in our world. Father, we as a church just pray that prayer. That we as a redeemed, as your people, we are willing to do whatever you call us to do. Father, whatever you call us to do, to care for the orphans, the fatherless in our world. Father, would you speak to your children now? God, speak to your children now. Spirit, what are you saying? Help them to hear your voice. Help them, God, to hear your voice. God, what are you calling your children to do? And Father, I do pray that you would call some of us who have never thought about this that we would consider and prayerfully consider adopting a child or becoming a foster parent or participating in safe families where we provide respite care. Or God, maybe you're calling us to come around adoptive families and to help them and to assist them. Father, we will do whatever you call us to do to care for the orphans in our city and in the world. Thank you, God, that we are no longer orphans. Thank you, Jesus, that you came for us. When we had no one to look out for us, when we had no one to care for us, when we were without a father, you came for us. And you pursued us. And you shed your blood for us on that cross. So that in your death we might live. And now, God, you call us to do the same, that we will lay down our lives. 
our dreams, our plans, our idea of what a family should be. God, speak to your people and lead us in your ways. God, lead us in your ways. Give us the grace to do for them what you have done for us. That the world may see our good works and glorify the Father in heaven. In Jesus' name.